special day, Holy Week Thursday, or as it's called, Bondi Thursday. It's when we think of Jesus and how he enjoyed the Passover meal with his disciples and then instituted the Lord's Supper, which we will be observing at this worship service on this, again, very special day. We're still under the theme, the crucial hours, and we're especially looking at that hour as Jesus gave his Holy Supper, and so today's theme is the three unions in Holy Communion. Once again, welcome to all and welcome to our guests and visitors. This is the service that we also live stream and is recorded, and so a warm welcome to those who are worshiping online. Let's open as we sing the opening hymn, which is hymn number 136, verses 1 to 3 and 5. "'Twas on that dark, that doleful night," from the Red Hymnal. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, If we claim to be without sin, Father, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrifice your only Son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in the joy of the Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days.
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. We continue as we sing the psalm of the day, Psalm 116, found in the red hymnal in the front on page 107. We sing Psalm 116. Psalm prayer. Lord, we confess our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature for us ever to rid ourselves of it. But we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. We plead that your spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Christ our Lord. Passion history portion for today is the last one, part seven, and you'll find it up on the screens and also on the back side of your worship folder, and it is a responsive reading as usual. Part seven. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, was a good and righteous man. He had not agreed with their plan and action. 
He was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. There was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, we remembered that that deceiver said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he is risen from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Together we speak the seasonal response. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. Please fill out one of the white attendance guest cards and you can return those to us as you put it into an offering basket after the sermon. It allows us to serve you well, to get to know our guests and also to encourage others. And those online can fill it out using the QR code or the link that's above the video. We appreciate you filling that card out. Let's sing together the sermon hymn. It's one from the blue hymnal, hymn number 669. We have help also as we'll be singing this. Uh, we appreciate that. And the title is In This Holy Blessed Communion, hymn number 669.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. This afternoon we gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, or another name for it is Holy Communion. A communion is a joining together. You can almost see those two words in it, a common union where two would come together over one thing. Tonight, and we look at and rejoice in the three communions that take place during the Lord's Supper. The first one we want to focus on is the union between bread and wine with the body and the blood. Now, if you ever go to a dinner party and you're wondering what you're going to be eating or what food's in front of you, for some of those items of food, you don't have to look as far as, well, what's in front of you. Here's an example that maybe perhaps you sit down at the table and there's a bowl of fruit there. And you go and you reach in and you pick up one that is round and orange and you peel the skin off and you taste it and it, oh, it tastes like an orange. You know exactly what you are eating. You know exactly what's there. You know this is an orange that came from a tree. Yet there might be some items on the menu or that you might be eating that, well, you don't know what's all went into it. Maybe an example is, well, for instance, meatloaf. You can tell it's meatloaf, but if you go and, and taste it, you, you know there's meat in it, but if you want to know what all the different ingredients are present there, what all the elements are present there, unless you have really good taste buds, you're going to have to go ask the person who made it. What's the recipe? What elements did you put in to make this dish before me today? When we come to the Lord's Supper, it's easy for us to use our eyesight and our, our senses to see that, well, bread is present and wine is present. Anyone who would deny that would not only be not be denying their own senses, but also what God clearly says in Scripture, where Jesus says there in Luke chapter 22 that bread and, well, fruit of the vine there are present. But don't let your taste buds fool you. Don't let your, your senses fool you. There's much more here that meets the eye. There's more than just bread and wine there, that there's something in with and under the bread and the wine. As Jesus also says in Matthew 26, this is my body and this is my blood. Jesus' body and blood are truly present there in with and under the bread and the wine. Somebody who sees this might ask and say, wasn't Jesus just speaking figuratively when he said this? That's a reasonable assumption to make if it was, well, anybody else saying it. They might go and say, well, doesn't this just represent Jesus' body and represent Jesus' blood? The fact that the wine is red and a liquid and the, the, the bread maybe looks like flesh? Well, if anybody else was saying that this is my body, this is my blood, we'd say you're crazy. There's no way this can be true because I can see you in front of me. There's no way you can be in two places at once. Not for our Lord and Savior, not for Christ, who was fully God and is able to be at multiple places at once. When he says, this is my body and he can do anything and this is my blood, we know that it's truly there. That is truly present there in with and under the bread and the wine. Not only this that lends it us to believe that this is true, Jesus also referred to this as a new covenant and new covenant. A new covenant is... Well, a solemn agreement, a binding contract. If you know anything about contracts, it's something that needs to be very particularly worded. You need to make sure you have all the wording correct so people understand what is going on here. Jesus knew what he was instituting. He knew that his words at this time were going to be recorded for the centuries to come as people would be celebrating this Lord's Supper and receiving the benefits that come from it. If Jesus had intended to convey an idea of representation, he could have done that with his wording. He could have said, this looks like my body, or this symbolizes my blood. Or he could even said, this will remind people of my body and blood. Yet what does Jesus do? He chooses his words carefully and says, this is my body, this is my blood. In addition to all this evidence, Paul reiterates the fact when he says in 1 Corinthians 11, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. 
Paul very clearly there says that when we eat and drink, we need to recognize the body and blood of Christ. The only way you're able to recognize something is if it is truly actually there. If it's not there, you can't recognize it. Paul goes even further. Further to say, if people are not eating this supper in faith and not recognizing that the body and blood of Christ are truly there, they're sinning against not bread and wine, but the body and blood of Christ in union there with the bread and the wine. It doesn't make sense to our human logic, but God says it's very clearly to be true, so we take it as fact. Martin Luther said it well. He said, if a hundred thousand devils should rush forward and ask the question, how can bread and wine also be the body and blood of Christ? We know that all the demons together with all the scholars of the world do not have as much wisdom as God does in his little finger. Very clearly he's making the point that God is much wiser than us. God knows much more than we do, so we know what he says here to be true. We know that it's true when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, that Jesus Christ's body and blood are present there in the Lord's Supper and beautiful communion with the bread and the wine. And that brings us to the next communion that we celebrate with the Lord's Supper, the communion of sinners and God. You see, there's, in our lives, there's a lot of different levels of friendships. Perhaps some of you have friends you still keep in good contact with from maybe grade school or high school. Maybe people you go and visit all the time. You remain good friends over all these years. Maybe you have some from grade school and high school that you're a little bit farther apart. Maybe you talk on the phone every once in a while or you keep connected on Facebook or social media, but you don't really see much of one another. And when you do, maybe they say, oh, well, I come through your area all the time. We should get together for a weekend or something. And you might say, oh, that sounds great. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, uh, I don't know if I, I'm willing to spend a weekend of my time with this person. My relationship isn't quite to that point. And then there's those other relationships we have. Maybe those with our neighbors. Maybe we have really good ones with our neighbors where we have a neighbor that every time we get the mail, we say hi, have a conversation, or after doing yard work, we talk with them and strike up a conversation. You're friends with them, yet you've never been in their house and they've never been in yours. You know with that relationship you have that, well, you're just not to that point, but you are still good friends. And yet, maybe there are some other people who we would never consider inviting over for dinner. Perhaps there's a neighbor who hasn't treated you that well. Maybe it's a neighbor who goes across their yard to go and take your patio furniture to use for the wild late-night parties that they have in their backyard. A neighbor who is, well, just disrespectful to you in any way possible. A neighbor who... Maybe you would never consider the notion of possibly inviting them over to your house for a meal, and you know that they won't invite you over to theirs. This was really our, basically our relationship with God, where we were that bad neighbor, where there was no reason why God should invite us to this beautiful meal that he has prepared for us, for you and me. Our relationship was so bad with God that we really shouldn't consider coming anywhere near his house or anywhere near his property for fear that he was going to yell at us to send us away. Not that God was one who was angrily there waiting to scare someone away because he was an angry person, but because of all the terrible things that we had done to him as we repeatedly went against his word, repeatedly went against his laws and acted obnoxiously to him. If we want to use that example of a neighbor throwing a party, we would be the ones throwing this wild party. God would very politely come over and ask us to turn down the volume, and we would just crank it up higher and higher. It wouldn't surprise us if God were to go and build a wall or a massive fence to completely block us off from him, saying, I don't want to see this mess that they have over in their yard and everything they do. I want to cut myself off from them. And to an extent, that's true. Except it's not God that built the wall. It's not God who cut himself off from us. It's us when, with our sinful nature and our sins who have cut ourselves off from God. Where we are the ones who destroy this, this neighborly relationship. Paul describes it this way. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Despite everything that we have done, what does God do? 
He doesn't build that wall or that fence to cut, our, ourselves off, cut himself off from us, but he invites us. Invites us by saying, take and eat, take and drink. Why would God give us such a gracious gift? Why would God do something so loving to us when we've done everything to not deserve even a little bit of it? The answer is found in the Lord's Supper itself. Found there in Christ's body and blood, which we've established, is truly present there in the Lord's Supper. That same body and blood that's present there is what brings us together. Paul goes on to say, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Through Christ's body, through what he did there on the cross, he has made us holy in God's sight without blemish, has washed all those sins that we've committed away. Because of that, he invites us to him. The Bible says this, This is my body given for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we come up to the Lord's Supper, we come up to this, this table that God invites us to, we are receiving that forgiveness of sins, that same forgiveness that Christ won there on the cross. These are special words for us. They assure us that God, not only is God interested in being our neighbor, but he's eager to have us come to his table. He invites us to not just be on the guest list, but to be the VIP. He is happy and joyous that we have come to this table where he can give us that forgiveness of sins and bless us in so many ways. What a beautiful example here that we have of God's love for you and me. Of all the three unions that we have in Holy Communion, this is perhaps the one that is the nearest and dearest to our heart because we're assured there with Christ's body and blood that we have truly received that we are worthy to dine at this table. Not just this table here on earth, but worthy to dine at the table of victory one day in heaven. Which brings us to communion point number three. Where there's a communion, there's a union between believers and one another. The thing about a dinner party is if you're invited to that party, you oftentimes don't know who else might be coming there. And maybe you're seated at a table and you're next to someone and, well, you know nothing about them. If you strike up a conversation with them and you find out you have absolutely nothing in common, well, it might be a long dinner party, wouldn't it? You might think, what am I going to talk to this person about? I'm going to be left here in silence this entire time. But if you have one thing in common, one thing in common that you share with them that can change the entire outlook of that meal and the time spent there because you're able to talk about this commonality that you have, this shared interest that you have there at that table. As we look at that first Lord's Supper, that first Holy Communion, we see a group of disciples. A group of disciples who were different in many ways. There were some who were fishermen, some who were tax collectors, some who were zealots and some who were doubters, some who were ambitious and others who were quite the more laid back. Yet they formed one group. How were they all able to get along there? We know their history of there's been many times that they were bickering, but there they are all united as one. How? The answer is Jesus. They were all united around Christ. That's what bound them together and that's what binds us together too. As we come up to the Lord's table and we look around, we see many of us here are different. There are some blue-collar workers and some white-collar workers. Some young, some old. There are women, there are children, there are men. Some who vote on one side of the political aisle and some who vote on the other side of the political aisle. And the devil wants nothing more to, uh, for us to look at everyone and see everyone through those lenses. To look at those differences between one another and say, look at them, look at how they act, look at how they vote, look at who they are. I don't like them because of that and focus on what separates us to cause divisions. But my friends, we are united. All those things don't matter. What matters is that we're united in faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we come up to the Lord's Supper, we're not only united with one another here in faith and doctrine, but we're united with all those who believed, all those saints from all time who've come and taken this Lord's Supper. You see, tonight you may 
stand next to someone who, next to someone who may vote differently than you. Someone who may have a different idea of the issues where the issues in the congregation should go. That will not matter at all. It will not matter at all because we are all united on Christ. And we'll be standing next to a, fo- a fellow Christian who believes the exact same thing that you believe. Paul writes, We who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. Tonight we all stand together confessing that we are here as one. We are confessing, as Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yes, we express unity here in church in many ways. And the fact that we are praying together, and the fact that we, that we say the creeds together, that we sing hymns together, But none is more of an example of our unity than when we come up and join together at the Lord's table. Join together and saying with one another, I believe the same thing that you believe. We believe in Jesus as our Savior. In a few moments, we will be gathered here to take Holy Communion, to take the Lord's Supper. As we do so, recognize those different unions that we celebrate. This union of body and blood, in, with, and under the bread and the wine, The union between ourselves and God is that barrier is broken because of what Christ has done and we receive that forgiveness of sins. The union we share with one another in the same faith and hope for eternal life with our Savior forever in heaven. Amen. At this time, we'll collect our offering of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also place those white attendance cards in the offering plates as they are passed. We love because Christ first loved us. We continue with the offering hymn. Hymn number 315, stanzas 1, 4 through 6.
please stand for prayer. Our Savior Jesus, as the true and fulfilled Passover lamb, you came to save us from eternal death. You came into this world and you gave of yourself on the cross for our sins. Always work true repentance in our hearts, Lord. May your body and blood given and shed for our sins and imparted to us here in bread and wine in that supper which commemorates your death ever nourish our faith, cheer our hearts, and strengthen our will to live godly and upright lives. Do not allow Satan to rob us of the treasures of heaven by tempting us to love the treasures and pleasures of this world. As you went resolutely forth to meet the enemy, intent on doing the Father's will, so may we be set to obey him in everything, so that what pleases him pleases us. By your Spirit, help us to watch and pray at all times and to be fully aware of the weaknesses of our flesh. Precious Redeemer, May your face that once reflected the burden of our sins and the anguish of hell be ever turned toward us in love and tender tenderness. Let no one who has known you as friend and Lord as well as Savior ever betray your love. And may the dear blood once shed for us be for our sins the perfect cleansing power. In your name, dear Savior, we also pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated for a short announcement. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members of our church and church body, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, come to Holy Communion, approach up the middle and return by the side aisle, and when indicated, kneel or remain standing at the rail. Receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray. If you prefer to be handed the wine cup, simply hold out your hand. Hold your wafer hand up like stop if you would like to have a gluten-free wafer available in a sleeve on the tray. Non-alcoholic white wine is also available in the middle of the cup tray and cup receptacles are along the walls. The common wine cup or chalice is provided as a choice. And the general blessing will be given to all at the close of Holy Communion. Please come now. Everything is ready.
Please stand. May this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. We respond as we thank the Lord, as we sing this song on page 36 in the front of the hymnal. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. <laughs> the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. You could have blown in, I'm sure, to church today. Quite the wind out there. Uh, and uh, you could hear it actually uh, on the windows there as well. Uh, good to see you on this special day, uh, Holy Week Thursday. And as you know, we have many services that are coming up tomorrow, Good Friday, 12 o'clock noon, and also at 6 o'clock. Both are identical services, and so pick one, either at noon or 6 o'clock. And we have a quite a wonderful service going through the words of Jesus uh, as he spoke those words while on the cross. On Easter Sunday, we'll celebrate Jesus' resurrection at 7.45 in the morning and at 9.30. So if you're used to coming at 10.30, please uh, adjust. It'll be 9.30 on Easter Bible information class will be starting up on Wednesday, and it'll be each Wednesday from 6.30 to 8. This is for anyone, especially for people who would like to become eventually members of our congregation, would like to grow in God's Word, and so it'll be held in the council chambers. You can come in the office door uh, right across from the school and come right in. It's the room uh, that is right there. God's blessings to all of you once again. So good to see you. So good to have remembered uh, and received the Lord's Supper. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>